So today we are going to take a look at how to integrate a CG element into a live action shot. Now in this case we're using the common household gnome, but you could be doing anything. This could be a dinosaur, could be a TARDIS, could be a space alien, it could even be elements of the 1920s if you're trying to create a production value in a period piece. The point is this is something that just a few years ago would have required a major visual effects post house and you can actually do it just with the software you have lying around the house. So if you have uh, Adobe Creative Suite and some kind of 3D application even if it's the free blender and so hopefully what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is how possible it is to actually take a shot from start to finish. The most important thing is production planning. If you plan right then you simplify a lot of the things that you have to do in post. Okay, let's dig in. Our first step is to remove lens distortion because that'll confuse the 3D tracker we're about to use. And I wouldn't normally do this in Photoshop, but Photoshop's part of the Creative Suite and it's the closest thing I could find to easily do lens distortion for the tutorial. So we'll bring our video clip into Photoshop and we'll use the lens correction tool. Make sure when you use it you select the right camera. In this case it's an iPhone 6 Plus and you don't allow it to do any auto scaling. We want to keep it in its correct scale so we can reintroduce the lens distortion later if need be and not have to guess what the scale is. We'll then apply the correction and render back out as a video. Now we bring the clip into After Effects, create a comp out of it and apply the camera tracker. Now we will pop into the camera tracker before it gets too far and in the advanced section we will check detailed analysis just to give it a little bit of extra oomph to make sure it's as accurate as possible. And within a little while it will finish analyzing and solve for the camera. And when you're all done you'll see a bunch of colorful confetti all over your screen. These are the individual points that After Effects has tracked. The color has to do with how accurate each point is. But the most important number to look at is this average error over here. Anything around a pixel is good. I, I like to get this under a pixel but After Effects doesn't give you a whole lot of control. But today again we're trying to focus on tools that you already have at your disposal. So we're pretty happy with our 1.19 pixels and we'll move on from here. Okay, now while After Effects has tracked the scene in 3D, it doesn't actually know where the ground is. It doesn't have any artificial intelligence built into it, so we need to tell it. And to do that, we simply select a bunch of points that are on the ground, and then once we do that, we get this surface normal target shape that we can drag over to where we want to put our origin. Now, it makes sense to put the origin right by where you're going to have your object. So the origin is the center of 3D space in your 3D scene. It's where the three axes X, Y, and Z meet at 0, 0, 0. So we'll put it right where we think our gnome should be. Then right click and choose Set Ground Plane and Origin. With that complete, it's time to select some other points and make some After Effects reference solids for different elements. So we want one for the trash can. And it's a good idea to get reference solids for both of the walls nearby because those are pretty good landmarks in terms of understanding the scene. Then we'll go ahead and give sensible names to those reference solids we just created. Now the next step is really dependent on the 3D software you're using. Every 3D animation package has a different way of getting stuff from After Effects into its 3D environment. I'm working with Modo here and so we'll use the special Modo script that comes with Modo for After Effects for exporting data into a format that Modo understands. Now we step into our 3D application and as I mentioned I'll be using Modo here but you can be using pretty much anything including the free Blender and the first thing we need to do is obviously import in that After Effects scene that we just created or we just exported out of After Effects and once that's done we'll add a ground plane to the scene. Mainly because we just need something to catch the shadows that the 3D object is going to generate. Once we scaled up the ground plane to the correct size, we'll then look through the actual camera that we got from After Effects and see how those dummy shapes, those solids that we created in After Effects are looking. And we'll see that everything looks pretty good. Our ground plane in my case is not extending as far as it needs to be to actually catch the shadows once they start falling on the scene. So I'll just quickly go and correct that. And we now have our scene set up ready to introduce our 3D object. 
Before I do anything else, I'm actually going to bring in the footage, the background plate that we're working with, so that we can see and make sure that everything lines up once we introduce our 3D. So uh, let me bring that in. I'll align it as a background element, align it to camera, and we can now see our footage superimposed in the 3D view. Now the only important piece of geometry other than the gnome itself and the ground plane is the trash can because that's the thing that the shadow of the gnome is going to fall across and so we need to model that. So we'll stretch out that solid that After Effects created for us to fit the width of the trash can and we'll use that as a reference as we're modeling the cylinder that's the actual shape of the trash can. And thanks to the marvels of screen capture acceleration I'll uh, speed through this bit but you can see we're just building out a simple cylinder that matches the general shape of the trash can and we'll tweak it back in our reference view where we can see the source footage. It's a good idea to visit a few different frames to make sure the geometry lines up everywhere you go. You can make a few tweaks until it just settles into the right position. The next step is to create the shadow for the sun and so we'll add back the ground plane and we'll move what's called a directional light and adjust its angle until the shadow lines up with the shadows that are being cast by the actual objects in the scene. So because we already have the trash can in the scene, we know what its shadow should look like, so our 3D stand-in of the trash can just needs to have the same length and direction of shadow. Once we have that set up, we know that when we put a gnome in the scene, its shadow will also be cast in the correct direction because we've already tested that out and set it up with the trash can shadow. To make sure we nail it, I'm going to superimpose our geometry over the actual background image and I'll temporarily make the ground plane a little transparent so we can actually see where it should be lining up and just get it exactly in place. And of course, just remember to turn off the transparency for the ground plane when you're done. Now the next step actually needs to happen back at the shoot. When you're shooting, you should take a reference HDR image. And the easiest way to do that today is just to go out and buy one of these cheap little $200 uh, VR cameras. They're not particularly great for video, they have a lot of compression, but for still images they work great. So here I used the Kodak SP360. And what I've done is I've taken multiple exposures at different brightnesses and then Photoshop is going to stitch those together into one high dynamic range image. So select Merge to HDR Pro from the Photoshop file menu, select all your images and click Open, and Photoshop's going to stitch those together. Now make sure you have the 32-bit option selected, and that'll ensure that you get the highest dynamic range in the final product. In case you are wondering, we're going to use this HDR inside the 3D application to accurately render the lighting that would have fallen on the object if it had really been living in that scene. And it means we don't have to spend a whole lot of time manually placing a whole bunch of lights inside the 3D application. This one HDR dome image is going to do all the lighting for us. Now, when I shoot an HDR like this, I actually shoot two one with the color chart and one without. So we're going to repeat the import, but this time we're going to bring in the shots that I did with a color chart. And what this is going to allow us to do later is to actually have a color reference to keep everything in sync so that we know the actual color on the set compared to the color that's coming out of the 3D renderer. It'll make sense later. Now just like this isn't a 3D tutorial, it's also not a Photoshop tutorial, so I'm going to assume you know how to take those two images and combine them as two separate layers in the same document. But what I'm not going to assume you know is how to convert this into what's called an equirectangular image. That's the format that most 3D apps are going to expect this to come in. So in the Photoshop filter menu, we're going to choose polar coordinates, and we'll just make sure in the polar coordinates settings that it's set to polar to rectangular. So it's going to take our polar our round image and turn it into an equirectangular image. Now we'll repeat this for our other layer. Remember we have our reference layer with a color chart. And now we have to do a few little bits and pieces just to make this work. We're going to make a guideline for where the horizon should be and we'll just shift the image up so that it lines up horizon to the center of the image. In an equirectangular image like this, sometimes called a lat long, the center of the image is going to be the horizon and everything stretches top and bottom so the very top of the image is the 
uh, zenith is what they call it, and the very bottom of the image is the nadir. And so we just want to make sure everything's lined up correctly. Now you could clone the bottom just to fill in that missing detail, but we'll just copy a little sliver of the end of the clip, flip it over, and then stretch it out just to cover in the bottom because the general lighting that you're going to get from the ground isn't going to be all that important as long as the color is about right. If you had a bunch of reflections in your 3D object, you might start to worry. But for the most part, you can just grab a little bit of the corner section and just pull it down to fill in the gap. The other thing is equirectangular images are usually two to one. So we'll finally resize the shot so that it's two to one in terms of aspect ratio. And that means we're all set and we'll just export out as EXRs ready to go into the 3D application. EXR is really the best format of choice these days for getting images around while keeping all the high dynamic range data preserved. So we'll go ahead and bring in those two HDR images into Modo and we'll assign them as our environment map. Uh, again, it's going to be different depending on the application you're using, but they should all have a pretty simple way to add an HDR image. And you can easily search the web for a tutorial on using HDR or high dynamic range lighting in your 3D application of choice. So what I'm also going to do is quickly just add a sphere and give it a perfectly mirrored uh, reflection. And that just allows us to see how well our scene is reflecting, just kind of as a quick check to make sure everything's working. Uh, one thing you'll notice, at least in my shot here, is that as I look carefully, the image is actually inverted. The trash is on the left when it should be on the right. And so I'll just go in and put a negative scale on my horizontal, and that will fix that problem. Now everything's set up, and I'll confirm that I can switch to my color reference when I need to render that later, and that's all good. And the next step is to go and actually get ourselves a model. So we're going to go to the handy Turbo Squid, which is a great repository of online objects. And one thing I just want to mention here is that to model things well in 3D could take hundreds of hours. And chances are someone has already built one online. Now some of these models seem quite expensive, like $150, $200 for a nicer model. But when you think about how many hours you would have to spend modeling it yourself, and you'll often find that the model you're looking for is actually free, or at least there's a solid enough one that's free that you can then tweak for your purposes. And we're just going to use this fairly low resolution, actually, model of a gnome. And we're going to download it and bring it into our scene. Now, we should probably spend a bit of time working on this, but I'm just going to be lazy with this one and just work with the textures as they come. Uh, if this was a real shot that I was working on, I'd probably spend a bit of time adding a little bit of dirt and diffusion and uh, break up some of the speculars a little bit. But I'm going to go ahead and drop it in the scene and start to render it out using that high dynamic range image that we just got. Uh, one thing to bear in mind is you want to make sure that any other light sources, such as the directional light that we were using earlier for the sun shadow, has been turned off. And we're just going to render out a little gnome on his own. Once that's done, we need to create our shadow effects. And to do that, we create what's called a shadow catcher. Now again, this is going to vary how you create a shadow catcher from application to application. So you'll just have to look for a tutorial on making a shadow catcher. But basically what it does is it catches the shadow on the other geometry without actually rendering the other geometry. So it gives us a shadow pass we can use in compositing that has all the nice subtle nuances of global illumination shadow, the way all the various light sources would interact and bounce around to create a shadow in the real world. So we'll create a shadow pass of our high dynamic range image lighting. And when that's all done, we'll go back and use the same shadow catcher, turn off our high dynamic range HDR lighting, and use that directional light we created earlier to create a long shadow just from the direct lighting of the sun. Because we need both of those shadows, the subtle multi-angle shadow created by the HDR and the single direct shadow from the sun.
And then finally, we go in and we're going to move the position of the camera. Now normally you don't want to move the position of a camera because that camera position perfectly matches the camera from the real world cinematography. So if we move the camera in the 3D app, we're actually going to break the link between the 3D and the footage that we shot earlier. But in this case, we just want to get a reference shot. So we're going to move the camera so that we can see that color chart. And just so that we have him as a reference in case we need him, we will move our gnome into position and alignment. And then we'll just render out a single frame in the same color space as the rest of the renders so that we can use that in our compositor as a reference. Now we're going to composite the scene together in Fusion. I know we were in After Effects before when we actually solved the scene with the 3D tracker, but node-based compositing is really the best way to put a shot like this together. And given that Fusion's free, well obviously it fits into the category of whatever software you happen to have lying around. And so that's what we're going to go with. The first thing we want to do is match the two color references. So you'll see we have a color reference from our original source footage. We shot at the front end of the footage of the scene. Just had someone standing there with a color reference card. And then we have our color reference card that's been rendered out through the 3D scene from our HDR lighting. And you can see how much of a cast that uh, HDR lighting scene has. And so what we need to do is do our best to line up the color space of the HDR lighting, and that will push the coloring of our gnome to match the background coloring. So we have a nice alignment. Now this is never going to be perfect, but what I'll typically do is use a corner pin to remove the perspective of each of these shots. And you see I have it uh, perfectly aligned to the corners of the card in each shot. And that gives me an apples to apples comparison. Uh, you could take this into Resolve and use the Grey Tag Macbeth Resolve Automatic Color Match. Uh, but in this case, we're just going to eyeball mainly the blacks, the whites, and the grays to get rid of the basic color shift. If you try to go too crazy with this and get every color swatch to match from both images, you'll end up with this horrible uh, solarizing posterization uh, banding. So we don't want to do that. So it's best usually just to focus for the most part on the black, white, and gray swatches. And here I am just looking at the red, green, and blue channels separately and adjusting the intensities of the red, green, and blue, black, and white points individually. It's usually the best way to do it. Uh, you'll have to back and forth because as you adjust the white point, the black point will shift off. And as you adjust the gamma of the gray point using this levels operator is what I'm doing here. Uh, you will end up upsetting the black and the white points. So you have to kind of do a little bit of back and forth, back and forth until everything lines up. Okay, so here we are ready to composite our shot. You see we have our gnome, we have our background, and we have the shadow mat that we created. This is the HDR shadow mat. And we're going to comp these together. And all we do is add a merge node here in Fusion, connect the gnome to the foreground, and then if we look at that in one of the viewers, you'll see, sure enough, we have a gnome, and he's moving along nicely matched up with the footage. Now we need to introduce our shadows. The first thing we'll do is add a color correction to the background, and we'll drag the gain slider all the way down, and you see we are creating a massive shadow in the background but it's more one of those Independence Day eclipse the entire town kind of shadows. So we want to limit that shadow effect to only where the gnome is occluding the shadows. And to do that, we simply pipe that gnome shadow pass that we created earlier into the mask input of the color corrector. And now as we pull the slider down, you'll see that we've created a shadow just in that area. And you'll see that we can turn that on and off and you definitely notice that nice subtle shading detail. Now, don't panic, but I've gone ahead and sort of built this out a little closer to how I do this shot in the real world. Now, I'm a visual effects artist, so I uh, go in a little bit more detail than you may necessarily, but it gives you an idea of what you can do, and I'm just going to walk you through this. You've seen that we've already kind of got this in place with the previous simple version. But let's have a look at some of the things you could do just to enhance the shot and bring it to a more convincing state. All right, so first off, we start with our gnome. 
And one of the things that's always an issue with 3D renders is they're too crisp, they're too clean. They don't have the uh, aberrations that a lens introduces when light comes in through a camera. And there's this whole airy disk thing that we don't have time to get into, but a quick and dirty way to fix that is to use some kind of convolution kernel. And there's something in Fusion called a custom filter. And uh, in Nuke, I think it's just called convolution. But it allows you to create your own little fall-off pattern. And if you look up here in the custom filter, you'll see I have these numbers. I'm only using a 3x3 three three matrix here. And so I'm using the middle nine 3x3 three three, uh, numbers. The center pixel is going to be the main contributor to the new value. And then you see to the corners, or to the sides, I should say, there's values of 1, 1, 1, 1. So it's actually going to average the nearby pixels and blend them with the original pixel. But most of the value is going to come from the original pixel and some of it coming from the pixels on the side. And the result of this is you get a diffusion, but not a blur. So you see it retains some of the sharpness of the original image, but it still has a softness to it. And that's more like how things really happen than, say, just blindly adding a blur. See, if we add a blur here, and I actually need to turn on the LUT first so that we can see it correctly. See, a blur just smushes all the pixels together. It makes everything soft. Even though we've gone to the trouble of softening the image up, if you look at the rest of the shot, you'll see it's actually quite sharp. And that's because the iPhone will have applied a sharpening filter to make everything look crisp. So we need to do the same. I know this seems a bit silly. We're softening the image and then sharpening it again. But we're introducing just the right kind of artifacts in both steps to make it better match the source footage. Finally, we'll reapply the original alpha and pre-multiply to trim away any artifact pixels that got introduced in the process. So now we have our diffusion effect. We're now going to move to this first color corrector. And this is the color corrector that I generated from doing that color match that we looked at earlier when I was aligning the two gray tag Macbeth charts. And then we have a second color corrector just for dialing in the black and white points a little bit. So the first color corrector gives us kind of the scientific result. And the second color corrector is our ability just to artistically eyeball a better look. Now we have one more color correction. And that's this whole crazy list of nodes you see on the left. Now, if you look as I step through the footage, you'll see the exposure changes pretty radically through the shot. At the start, it's really quite bright. And towards the end of the shot, it gets dark. Well, our gnome has to start bright and get dark as well. Otherwise, it won't match the shot. So there are several ways to do this. You can't just keyframe it and eyeball it. But what I've done is grabbed a little bit of the wall just to the right of the door. And I've cropped it in, blurred it a little bit, and then scaled it to be the same size, scaled the cropped version to be the same size as the original footage. And you'll see what that does is, over time, it changes based on the lighting. And if we multiply our gnome by that lighting, we now have something that will vary its intensity over time. So this channel boolean down here is when we're multiplying that cropped area against the gnome to create that lighting change. Like I said, if you don't want to get all that fancy, you could just ride the levels with keyframes. All right, the next thing I've done is I've actually created a little bit of reflection in the shot. Because you'll see the other elements of the shot, especially the wall towards the back, have a reflection on their surface. So to do this, I've simply taken a copy of the gnome render. Now, I did have to stabilize it a little bit. And I've blurred it, put it upside down, and then blended it nicely into the background. And that creates the reflection. Heading back up to the top of the tree, you can see we have the same process that we used in the simple setup, just color correcting the shadow into place using this color corrector to get that nice HDR shadow dropped in. The long shadow pass, I'm focusing, I've just done a little bit of rotor to trim this off because I'm focusing just on the bit that wraps around the trash can. And we'll apply that with a little bit of blur onto the trash can to give the nice hard shadow. And so finally, we'll scale up to get rid of the little bit of black that occurred when we removed the lens distortion. And we have our final shot. 
Okay, so I was really hoping to create something that you could achieve without a whole lot of experience doing visual effects work. Something that you could work with, just like I said, with the software lying around the house. And I did that, I think, except for one little problem. Uh, and this is a common mistake. I actually created double shadows because the area that we're going to be comping a shadow onto with that long shadow is actually already inhabited by a shadow. And you'll see what happens when the two combine, you end up doubling the shadow. Now in the real world, that just doesn't happen. If one object blocks a light source, it creates a shadow. If a second object blocks the same light source, it doesn't add any more darkness to the shadow. The, the light was already blocked in the first place. The problem is, when we try to add a shadow over the top, it creates this unnatural second shadow where the shadows should really combine. Now, if you search the web, people are going to tell you that this can't be fixed. You need to go out and reshoot it. And while that's not really true, if you do want to simplify things for yourself, you definitely want to try and avoid shooting something that will cause a double shadow. So just try and find a different shot or move the gnome into a location where the shadows wouldn't overlap. Now, I hate to show any shot unfinished, so I will show you very quickly how I go about solving the problem of double shadows. And I don't really think you're going to find this out on the web in many places, so uh, this is actually probably a handy thing for you to see. Here's how it works. The first thing we do is we go into Mocha, which is uh, the industry standard for tracking planar surfaces, and we're going to track the plane of the floor that we're trying to fix the shadow on. So we'll track that in, and then once we have that tracked, we can use it to match move a single frame of the floor. So we find a nice wide section of the floor, and here's what you do. You create a roto shape to color correct the shadow away. So here you see I've done this, and I, it's not perfect, but I've basically removed the shadow. I could spend a little bit more time in it. I could probably take it into Photoshop. Uh, but I've removed the shadow, and now you'll see that it's match moved by that mocha track to continue to move in step with the shot over time. So it's a single frame that I've frozen, removed the shadow from, and now it's being match moved, thanks to mocha, back into place so that it lines up with the original unfrozen floor. Now here's the magic trick. We apply the shadow, and then we over-brighten the shot. Now this will only work in a float space compositor like Fusion. But we overexpose the entire shot. And then down here, we use a channel boolean in minimum mode. So it's going to pick the darkest pixel from either the original shot or our new plate that just has the shadow. Well, of course, because we over brightened it, it's not going to pick anything outside of that shadow area. But as we darken down the shadow, and let's just go back and adjust the shadow. You can see that as the shadow becomes the darkest thing, it takes over and its pixels replace the pixels from the original shot. But we don't get a double shadowing and we can just ease off until we get a nice combination between the two shadows. And that's what we've done here. And you'll see now that we have that nice connection. We have the original shadow and our new gnome shadow added in. And all is well. We have our final shot. Okay, so hopefully that tail end wasn't too intimidating, but the idea is that it really doesn't take too much, apart from a lot of foreplanning. You really need to shoot right. You need to plan on shooting that high dynamic range image with the Gray Tag Macbeth chart as a reference. But once you have those elements, you can pull off just about any shot. Now, like I said at the beginning, we did a simple gnome here, but it doesn't mean that gnome couldn't have been an animated dinosaur or a time machine, spaceship. Uh, buildings from another era. The same principle applies. You shoot it right, you drop your 3D object in, you hit render, render out the shadows, comp it together, and there you have your shot. By the way, if you want to look at this in a bit more detail, as part of the Cinema Fundamental courses on Moviola.com, we actually have an adding CG to live action VFX fundamental, and it will take you through this whole process in a lot more detail. Uh, thanks for watching and good luck putting ILM out of business.